Johnny pretty much summed it up. I, I don't know that we could have heard a better message than we heard to the children this morning. We actually should have had you stand right here because we all needed to hear that. Practice, but practice will be practice. Right. We could, uh, we all need to hear that. So thank you very much. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. This is good news for y'all. Since uh, Johnny done such a great job at children's church, I'll cut this short. We're going to move right along, and uh, we'll be out of here quickly. But before I get started, I want to share a little story I heard with you. <clears throat> I heard a story about a fellow that, uh, that took his wife and his mother-in-law to Jerusalem on vacation. Wonderful trip, trip of a lifetime. And while they was over there, the mother-in-law passed away. <laughs> so the fellow went to the American consulate to make arrangements to have his mother-in-law shipped back home. And the, the fellow at the American consulate said, well, it's going to cost about $15,000 to do this. He said, but if you want to bury her here, it's about $150. He thought about it a little bit. He said, no, I'm good. I'll go ahead and ship her home. The fellow said, man, you must have really loved your mother-in-law. He said, well, it's not so much that. He said, I heard a story about a fellow years ago that was buried here. And three days later, he arose, and I can't take that chance. <laughs> <laughs> I probably bet you should have been here for my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law's sister's here. <laughs> So there's a good possibility that Kenneth will never go to Jerusalem. I, I love my I love my mother-in-law. I, I have the greatest mother-in-law in the world. I would never that. It, it's just a joke. It's a joke. Just trying to be funny. I don't have a message to preach. Tony took care of that, so I'm just trying to kill a little time. No, I, I'm just kidding. I want to visit with you. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you would. We're going to look at two different places in the Bible this morning. We're going to look in the Old Testament, and then we're going to look in the New Testament. But the first, I want you to look at the 23rd Psalm. Everybody knows the 23rd Psalm. <clears throat> I'm going to be honest with you. Brother Steve, I'm thankful that we've had men's Bible study on Thursday night because I needed that. I, I've been struggling <clears throat> with some things going on. I, I really have. I, I've been struggling with... Uh, with this, with this, this COVID nineteen has got me so confused. You can't. I don't know. I don't know what to believe, what not to believe. It's got us going in a direction. We. I don't know what to do. We got an election coming up. We got. You can't watch the news. Everything you see is negative. There's nothing positive in it. A divided country. It seems like we can't say anything good about anybody. And I'm struggling with that because I'm right in the middle of it. And I know a lot of y'all are too. And I was talking to Sean one day, she said, I love the 23rd Psalm. I said, okay, that's what I'm going to go read the 23rd Psalm, because I do too, because it is words of comfort. Miss Betty, in fact, the 23rd Psalm is pretty much a walk of our Christian life. And so I began to read it, and I said, the Lord, I read this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And thank God you are our shepherd, because we need one. Obviously, we can't do it on our own. We need one. Thank you, Lord, for being our shepherd. I read a little farther. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And then I begin to think, hold up a minute here. Hold up, God. Let me Help me understand that he maketh me lie down in green pastures. My walk with Christ, I haven't always felt like the pastures was that necessarily green. And then I read this a little further, and it says, He leads me beside the still waters. And then I thought about that a little bit. I thought, wait a minute. God, I'm not sure my walk with you has always been by still waters. And right there I stopped. And I started to pray. Because what I was doing, Miss Betty, is I was questioning God. And I began to pray right there. And here's what God told me. And it was so perfect. God said, the pastures that I have you lay in 
are perfectly green in my eyes. That's exactly where I want you to be at that particular time. They might not be perfect to me, but they are sufficient. But that's exactly what God, where he wanted me to be. The still water's the same way. I've seen some rough waters. I've seen some rough waters in my Christian walk. Nowhere in Scripture will you find that once you give your life to Christ, your life is perfect. It doesn't say that. Nowhere will you find that. But what we find is Jesus promises to be with us every step of the way. And so the still waters, I said, God, where were those still waters? They was there. They just didn't seem that still to me. But he walked us by the still waters that he wanted us to walk by. We was there for a certain reason, and that's because he wanted us there. We go on to read a little farther. He leads me in the path of righteousness, righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Isn't that a wonderful verse to read? Even though in the darkest times of our lives, in the worst possible times of our lives, we should fear no evil because we have God on our side and he is in control. Amen. Now I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. For you are with me, your rod and staff, they comfort me. We are protected by God. Verse 5 says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Hmm. How about that? I had to stop again. Because I had to pray again. I've read the 23rd Psalm, I can't, countless times. I never read it this way. I never stopped four or five times during it. Because I had to question God, Miss Betty. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And it hit me. It hit me right there. How true that is. No truer statement has ever been said. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You know what? I was just missing the forest for the trees. That was what was wrong. I just wasn't understanding it the way God wanted me to understand it. I was making it worldly. What I was doing is when I would read the 23rd Psalm, I would find something wrong that was going on in my life, and I would go to that scripture, and I would read it, and I would immediately want God to make everything perfect for me. Well, it's not perfect. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to struggle. We're going to have things that happen to us that hold us back, that set us back, that causes us pain. But what we must remember is God will never leave us. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. We all have a storm. We've all been in a storm, some worse than others. And that's what I want to look at right now. I want you to flip over. If you have your Bibles, flip over with me. Very quickly, we're going to look in the book of Matthew in the 14th chapter. We're going to look at a storm. We're going to start in verse 22. <laughs> and if you will, follow along with me as we read the 14th chapter starting in verse 22. Immediately he had made the disciples get in the boat and before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was alone. But the boat by this time was a long way away from land. Beaten by waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And he cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the waters. And, and Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and was beginning to sink. And he yelled out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and took a hold of him, saying, Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? 
And when he got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this scripture, and we thank you, Lord, for your presence there that very day. We thank you for the disciples. For thank you for being there for the disciples, Lord. We thank you for coming to see, just like you do for us. Just help us in that. Help us pay attention to that. Lord, each one of us have a storm. We've had storms, but Lord, I pray today that we can find a blessing in that storm and know that you've never left us. You're here with us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Be with us. Guide and direct us. Amen. If you'll notice right here, the disciples was in a storm. Now let's think about it a little bit. Let's kind of lead up to this. Jesus had been doing what Jesus does. Taking care of people. Right before this happened, if you remember, he fed the multitudes. A lot of things was going on right now, and Jesus was going to take some time and go to pray. He sent his disciples out on the sea. Jesus was going to use this particular opportunity to teach his disciples. They was going to face a storm that night. Just like sometimes we do. Let's see what happens. As they was commanded to go across the sea, these men, in the will of the Lord, were struggling against the storm. It appears they was making no headway. They were stuck in a storm, unable to get out. The first thing we're going to see here is that storms are God's means of transportation. Have you ever found yourself stuck in a storm and no matter how hard you try, Brother Larry, no matter what you do, you cannot make any headway. You cannot find your way out of it. You struggle. We all have times like that. What possible good can come from them storms? What possible good? It draws us closer to our love and Savior. We begin to show our dependence. We begin to share our dependence on Him to get us out of these storms. The very thing the disciples feared the most to see was the very thing the Lord used as a vehicle to reveal Himself. Somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. is kind of when this would occur. They say the fourth watch. This would have been uh, at the darkest time of the night. And they were struggling. And then Jesus came walking on the water. Jesus did what Jesus does. When the times are the worst, when the hour is the darkest, when we think there's no way to move on, when it's as bad as we think it'll ever get, look around. Leave that Jesus is about to show up. Jesus is going to do what Jesus does. He's going to take care of us. He's going to tend to us. In the darkest hours, Jesus is going to tend to us. All right. Amen. You may be work, walking in that darkness. You may be facing something, and you may be going, well, where's Jesus right now? Why am I here? Why am I in this storm? Why am I laying in pastures that are not necessarily green like I think they should be? Where are you at, Jesus? He's there. He's never left you. Just like the disciples, he showed up right on time. They were scared for their life. They were facing the most difficult things they've ever seen, and he showed up. And here's something about Jesus that's so amazing. Jesus doesn't just show up. He shows up in a big way. Jesus shows up walking on the water. Jesus shows up. But you know what happens sometimes? Sometimes we fail to see. Sometimes we question when he does show up. Just like the disciples. See? They were scared. Jesus was coming to do what Jesus does. 
saved them, and they were scared. And they was in doubt. They thought it was a ghost. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 12, Solomon says that the Lord said he dwells in thick darkness. When we're in that very darkness, when we're dealing with the worst of the worst, God is still there. We've got to remember that, and then we've got to pay attention when he's trying to help us. God takes the darkness and turns it into light. Sometimes we don't understand that. But he's got light. He comes in the face of disasters. His disciples were in a fight for their lives. Mark chapter 6, verse 48 says they was toiling and rowing. These men were afraid for their lives when they thought all hope was gone and they was doomed. Jesus showed up. He was there in a magnificent way. There are times when we all have felt like we've lost that battle. I want to assure you, just as Jesus is in control of your blessings, he's in control of your storms as well. He's there. I found myself in a situation not too long ago that I was absolutely ashamed of my prayer life. I catch myself praying. God do this, God do that, God protect me from this, protect me from this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and I never take the time to just say, God, let me give you the honor and glory that you deserve. Let me humble myself in your presence and just thank you for what you've done and where I'm at and how you continue to lead us. I was ashamed. It was a one-sided prayer. It was all about me. I've been through a few storms. I've seen a few. Oh, by the grace of, grace of God. He has delivered me from them. And you know what? I thank God for those storms. Ooh, that's hard to say. <laughs> that's hard to say sometimes. Ooh, thank you, God, for the rough times in my life. I am thankful. I am thankful because I see the presence of Jesus. He's right there with me. We're going to move quickly. We're going to time. Storms are God's means of testing us. When Jesus did come walking on the water, the disciples did not recognize him. They thought he was a ghost. They cried out. But thank God, Jesus came with a message. A message of power. He came to them with a word of peace. He came to them and said, It is I. Do not be afraid. He's there with you. Do not be afraid. He's there. When he comes to us walking on the storms, he gives us a message of hope. That he gave the disciples that very night. He gave them hope. Even though they were scared, even though they doubted, he didn't turn away. In fact, in fact, he said, Be not afraid. It is I. We can find comfort in that. He's here with us. In everything we face, he's here with us. When Jesus showed up declaring his identity in his eye, it's the same statement Jesus said when he said, I'm at the door, I'm the way, the truth, the life, I'm the bread of life, I'm the good shepherd. Do you get the picture? This is Jesus, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said, Jesus, ask me to come to you. Jesus said, come. Peter done something the other disciples didn't get to do that night. He got to walk in his own storm. He got to walk right beside Jesus in his own storm. And his eyes was on Jesus and he walked on the water. 
But what happened to Peter is the same thing that happens to us a lot of the times. You know what happened to Peter when he took his eyes off Jesus? Started to sink. Started to sink. If you get nothing that I said today, if everything I said today is went in one ear and out the other, please listen to this one part, okay? When Peter took his eyes off Jesus, he sunk. But what happened next is the part of the story that I want to make sure we all know and understand. When he sank, when Peter sank, when Peter looked at the world, thought he could do it on his own, Jesus reached his hand out, took his hand, took his hand Amen. and he pulled him to safety. That's what he did. He didn't have to. He could have taught Peter another lesson. When I was spending my prayer time in such a selfish way, Sometimes I sometimes I do things that I know is not pleasing to Jesus. I know I do things that sometimes I try to do it on my own. Brother Ron, I heard you say this one time that you try to do it on your own. You try to do it, you want to fix it. You want to do it your way. You want to fix it. And we end up doing the same thing every time. We end up giving up, throwing our hands up, and going right back to where we should have started with and reaching out to Christ. And what he does is he reaches back. He gathers us up and takes care of us, even though when we don't think it's the green pastures that Scripture tells us. I can promise you, I can promise you that the grass is exactly as green as God wants it to be. The waters are as still as God wants them to be. Thank God. Praise the Lord. Maybe you're facing a storm today. Maybe you've got something going on in your life. Maybe you're struggling with something. I encourage you right now to seek Jesus. I encourage you to not let that storm control your life. I encourage you to humble yourself and just cry out for the Lord. Say, Lord, I just need your presence with me. I just need you to take my hand. He's there. He's there for us. And he will do that for you. You know, maybe you're someone that here, I, I believe with all my heart that everybody in this room today has a relationship with Christ. That is my prayer. But that's between you and God. Let me tell you something. If there's a doubt, if there's a doubt in your mind, then don't wait another second. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We might not make it out those doors today. Don't take that chance. Jesus offers us a free gift. The gift that he paid for so long ago on that cross by the blood of Jesus. When we seek him and ask him into our lives, ask him into the kingdom, he hears that prayer and he does it very 
If there's a doubt in your mind, don't wait another second. We're going to close with a short invitation. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask Miss Bailey to come. We're going to sing just a couple short. Of course, the, 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 the chorus. We're just going to sing the chorus.